pre-K through five, and he goes, the church, all old people. <laughs> We're playing. What time is that? On Sunday. We're playing this church. What time is that? I don't know. Better not be early, though. We're, we're getting $500. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not getting paid, but they said that Jesse can set up a table and sell some You know what?
I'll get so quiet. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Here's your practice one. He is risen. Let's try again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. There you go. So now you're ready for the one in the worship service. You got to bring it. So um, just a few announcements from me this morning. Um, Mission Possible is coming back on Tuesday, April 9th from 5.30 to 7. We're going to go to Golden Hill Nursing Home and spread Jesus' love to our friends. If you would like to go, you want to help out, see um, Terry Perry or Amy Kunstman, or if you have questions, see either one of them. They will have all of the answers for you. Next one is our own Celebration Singers are taking to the road on their 2013 spring tour. <laughs> on Sunday, April 14th, they will be singing next door at Mary Mother of Hope Parish, their Sing to the Glory of God Choir Festival. Um, all kinds of choirs from all over the area are going to be there. So if choral music is your thing, that's where you need to be that afternoon. So come on out and support our choir. Next, April 27th is our next mission dinner here at the church. It's a roast beef dinner um, from 4.30 to 7. You'll see on the screen that cost is $8 for adults and $6 for children. We need volunteers to make this event work really well. So if you're interested in volunte volunteering, helping out, see Don Rogers today. Next one, and this is really exciting. Mark your calendars for Pentecost on May 19th because we're going to have a joint worship service that Sunday with the churches for, for us and Third and Clenmore and Northminster and still possibly Highland might be in the mixed, in the mixed, in the mix. Um, I'm still reeling from the Buckeyes loss last night, so I'm really having a hard time. So we're having one combined service with four, maybe five churches. It's going to be a George Washington Intermediate School. What a fantastic way for the body of Christ to come together and celebrate Pentecost. We've been working on this for months. So this is really exciting. Hope that you make plans to be there and worship with our Presbyterian brothers and sisters. And I love when people leave announcements up here in the pulpit for me because it keeps me on my toes. Um, the last hymn is number 357. Apparently it's listed wrong in the bulletin. That's what I'm assuming. But it's correct on the sign. So there you go. The last hymn is 357. That's all for me. Let's worship God on this Resurrection Sunday. <clears throat>
We are here on this Easter morning because Mary of Magdala said, I have seen the Lord. We are here because Jesus still comes into our locked spaces and says, We are here like doubting Thomas who finally cried, We are here like Peter, tempted to forget the call of Jesus. We're here because of Jesus who asks us face to face. We are here to answer humbly. We are here and now we can proclaim Christ is risen.
Please hear an excerpt from our book of confessions. In Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Jesus Christ is God with man. He is the eternal son of the Father who became man and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and to complete his mission. The work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, man, and the world. Therefore, the church calls us to be reconciled to God and to one another. Let us now read the prayer of confession printed in our bulletin. Gracious God, we rejoice in the miracle of the resurrection and thank you for the gift of new life in Christ. As we have gathered to celebrate the joy of Easter, let us remember that we are to become the people of the resurrection, people who know that death has been conquered. Forgive our stubbornness and fears. Fill us with your healing love and help us to become active servants needed in this world today. We ask this in the name of the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now silently confess our sin to God. The stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. We are called to new life, a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. Friends, believe the good news of the resurrection. You are forgiven. Rejoice in knowing that God loves you and desires great joy for you. You will please rise and greet each other with the peace and joy of our risen Lord. may be seated and the children come on down for your time. Energy, here they come. All right.
have a seat either on the floor or there. Or you could sit with Gary. He doesn't bite very hard, at least. <laughs> he totally missed it. How are you guys today? Good? Huh? Good? How about great? Is anybody great this morning? Raise your hand if you're great. I want to talk to you. Yeah, me too. Great. I want to talk to you about gifts. This is a kind of a gift, right? What other shapes and sizes do gifts come in? Raise your hand if you have an idea. Mm -hmm. Squares. Good, Taishé. Other sizes, Will? Rectangles. Good. I did ask about shapes, didn't I? What do other gifts look like? What can another gift look like? This is a, okay. A horse. Ooh, now a horse would be somewhat, that would be fantastic. That's exactly what I'm going for. I have a toy match next to Awesome. Claire? Polka dots. Polka dots, they could have polka dots. Cole? Ribbons. Ribbons, yes. What do you think, Emily? What do gifts look like for you? A pony. A pony, yeah, we're, we're back at the barnyard. That's great. Thanks, brother. Okay, so gifts can sometimes look like this. They can sometimes have uh, bows on them, polka dots like you see on this one. They can be rectangles. They can be squares. They can be bags. They can be boxes. They can be animals, right? Okay, gifts come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Why do you like gifts? Why do you like gifts? Raise your hand if you have an idea why you like gifts. Hmm. Well, you can play with them. You can play with them, right. You can play with them. You can. You can Sometimes they're edible gifts, yummy. What else, Taishé? Why do you like gifts? Um, because me and Tyrone got um, Easter present, we, and we already know how to play them, because I took, I took a whole bunch of pictures. Even I took a you can use them right away. Yeah. So you like to take pictures, huh? Yeah. Awesome. Even of your sleeping brother and sister. We can use gifts. Do you know we've been given the greatest gift there is ever to be given? Ever. Ever, ever. Do you know what that gift is? Yes, Jesus. And not just Jesus, because Jesus is a great gift, but something... Yeah, birthday party, so it was good. <laughs> you thought I missed that, didn't you, Brett? I heard it. There's something special about our gift. Look, this gift doesn't have anything in it, because just like the empty tomb, Jesus gave us something very, 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 very special. Empty tomb, empty bag, empty tomb. Why would something empty be special about Jesus. What about that empty tomb? It's very, very special. It's an amazing gift. What is it, Claire? Do you know? Hmm, it's kind of a toughie. It doesn't have bows or polka dots on it. It's not a horse or a pony. What is it about that empty tomb that's a special gift? Hmm. Yes, there was. Excellent. There was an angel in there, and... There was excitement was filled. Risen? That's right. There it is. God was risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. This kind of a gift is the only kind of a gift that can be given to every single one of you, every single one of us. And it's a gift that always keeps on giving. We talk about that all the time, about some kinds of gifts. Oh, that's the gift that keeps giving. There isn't a bigger gift that keeps giving than this one because Jesus loved us enough to teach us how to follow him, to show us how to live, talk with one another, listen to one another. And then he died on the cross, really died. Not kind of, sort of. He really died. Mm -hmm. And because of his death, we will have life eternally. And here and now, you live with hope, you live with excitement, you live with life because of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk to your moms and dads about, that fantastic gift. Even though sometimes gifts can look like this and, and we can unwrap them and look at them, this gift that Jesus gave us is a gift we can feel. 
life. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, God, for giving us life, literally for creating each one of us, especially our wonderful children. But also thank you for giving us life in you. Help us all as children of God to not miss the opportunities of fully living for you. To not just look for gifts that we can unwrap, but in life that we can live here and now for you and when we get to see you again face to face. We pray all of this in Christ's name. And all God's kids said, amen. Thanks for coming down, guys. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us to see what you would have us know from your word. Open our hearts and open our minds. In Christ's name, amen. Reading in the Old Testament, Psalm 119, 33 through 40, you can find this in your pew Bible, page 651. And we're looking at passages 33 through 40. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. And now reading from uh, New Testament. This is Romans 7, beginning on uh, page 1200 of your pew Bible. You'll probably get there before I do. All right, we're looking at uh, Romans 7, 1 through 6. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law, we are at work that were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now we're moving to Romans 8, 9 to 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life 
because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, spirit who dwells in you. And then finally, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who, lo who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Les. Please pray with me. Gracious God, you give us life. Life. To change our brokenness and our sin, our worries and our fears into action. Good action. Loving action. And so we pray that in this time, even as we reflect both on the psalm as well as our New Testament reading from Romans, that you would reignite within us, especially on this Easter morning, life, the kind of new life that you want us all to live. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, during Lent, we've journeyed through learning, or rather relearning for some of us, of course, our 10 commandments. And today, this journey comes to its culmination with thou shalt not covet. It goes on to say, not only your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to him or her. Last week, Palm Sunday, we reflected upon how painful it must have been for God in Christ to ride into Jerusalem knowing that even among those cheers of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even amongst those cheers, how many of them he knew because he knows our hearts were bearing false witness. Yet in he rode. So that his mission would be complete through the cross, the grave, and now resurrection morning. I'm giving you another chance at it. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. So if you thought that was peculiar, why are we talking about not covening on Easter Sunday? We talked about not bearing false witness last week on Palm Sunday. Maybe you're still getting your head around that. Why are we doing this today? Actually, hopefully this answer is a little bit clearer. Even as I was talking with the kids about gifts. Persons who call themselves Christians, who live this side of the cross, we know what the cross was about, we know what it stood for and stands for still, all of us persons who live this side of the cross have absolutely no need for a greater gift than that which Jesus Christ has given us. In the atonement of our sins through the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the greatest gift ever. This is it. 
And because of this gift, there isn't a single thing, person, place that we should want or yearn for more. We can't be given anything more than we've been given. Do you see that? We have no need for a greater gift than that which Jesus has given us. So then thou shalt not covet applies to much more than property. It applies to more than loved ones, to workers, to wealth, to titles, or any so-called material means of grace. We have nothing of greater need than that which God has supplied for us in and through Jesus Christ. You remember that old adage, there's a difference between a want and a need? You remember, you probably heard that recently or growing up. No, it's just the difference between a want and a need. You might want that, but do you need it, right? Remember that? You might want, let's use food, for instance, a supersized soda, burger, and fries, but your body needs a balanced diet, especially rich with fruits and fresh vegetables. People may want or covet all manner of things that others possess, but while not all people need those extra things, whatever those things are for you, you don't all need those extra things, all people do need Jesus Christ, period. Yet, and here's the toughie, we could just linger there and you'd say, yes, we do, we all need him. Let's go home, preacher. No. Nope. Yet once we know, or rather we really get to know him, and this high calling that it is in following him, we may be tempted uh, to no longer want his direction. This is the toughie. Last week I quoted theologian, pastor, and author John Stott. And some were puzzled by his notion that because of the demands placed upon believers by Christ, that many, he said, do not truly seek him. Well, in that book, just before that suggestion that I quoted last week, that many do not truly seek him, Stott criticizes those who would allow intellectual or moral cowardice, these are his words, to interfere with their wholehearted devotion to following Jesus Christ. Intellectual or moral cowardice to interfere with their wholehearted, not a little bit, wholehearted devotion to following Jesus Christ. So maybe that's where you're at this morning. Maybe it's where you're at. Maybe you, you want to believe in the resurrection, but you're not entirely sure that it's legit. Maybe knowing that God is love is important to you, but spurning the suggestion that as his followers you're called to love those people, oh, it's tough. Wants versus need. We want this kind of a Jesus. We need this kind of a Jesus. So just to be clear, Stott is suggesting that you may want, you may want to pacify the perspectives of the, might of the Messiah so as to dilute the demands of the fullness of the call upon you. But to be his, you need to sacrifice your own ego on the altar of our only Lord and Savior. Do you get that? The rest of this morning, that's what I'm going to be talking about. I hope you get that. It's not about us or how we want to see Jesus. It's about him, always him, and about how he wants us to see him and others. So this week, then, we return to the late great communicator, John Stott, as he reflects to this 10th commandment. And he says this, the Tenth Commandment is the most revealing of them all. In fact, it turns the commandments from an external legal code into an internal moral standard. Standard. It turns the commandments from an external legal code. Okay, I can see it, I can learn it, I can 
put it into action into an internal moral standard. You can't see this as much as you know. This is your barometer, whether you're following or not. Similarly, Watchman Nee, a church leader of the Christian teacher who worked in China during the first half of the 20th century, cautions us in a devotion that he wrote not to undervalue the significance of this commandment that we're studying by saying, in translating it, thou shalt not desire. Well, that's a little tougher than covet, isn't it? We can toss covet away. Eh, covet. Who does that? Thou shalt not desire, Watchman Nee says. And when we think of it that way, we're all brought face to face with the holy God and that we're not him. So then, a good summary of this final commandment would be an internal moral standard that keeps us from unhealthy desires. You can remember that one, hopefully, and write it down. An internal moral standard that keeps us from unhealthy desire. That's the point of the thou shalt not covet or desire. In our Old Testament reading, the psalmist asked to be taught, teach me, teacher, God, Almighty, the one who has all knowledge. The psalmist asked to be taught God's commandments, and in return for the teaching, he will keep the law and observe it with his whole heart. This unswerving devotion to God is reinforced by his promise to be inclined to God's testimonies and not selfish gain. That's right from Psalm 119. You heard it already today. 36. Inclined to God's testimonies and not to selfish gain. It's right in line with our commandment, isn't it? Have you ever made a promise that you knew was tricky even the minute you made it? Anybody ever been there? Uh, what did I just say? Tricky, right? Such was the case last Christmas at the Loudon household. And some of you know where I'm going with this. Stephanie and I reassured the children that, oh, well, the reason that Santa Claus didn't bring you a puppy for Christmas is that, there you go, you want a puppy, Taishé? <laughs> the reason he didn't bring you a puppy for Christmas was, well, we need to wait a little bit, and, and, and maybe, in fact, we will. This, at some point, after Maggie, our youngest, gets potty trained, you know, Spring, summer, we'll get you a dog. We'll pick one out. Well, guess what? There's Muffin. With a future veterinarian. Yeah, the story goes that Stephanie found this listing, and it's a really neat story of a family not too far from Pittsburgh in Oakdale. They had put it on Craigslist because of a variety of factors. They needed to give it up, and, and she's not quite a year, so she's mostly housebroken, although we've had a couple getting used to our home moments, but for the most part, housebroken. And Claire has some allergies, so we're excited to see that the, the mix that she is of Pekingese and Poodle will keep Claire from having allergic, allergic responses. Anyway, it was a fun story, and some of you know that Stephanie and I went to Pittsburgh last week. Well, we were there already planning to go, but on the way, we went to Oakdale and met the dog, and of course, as soon as it jumped in my lap, oh boy, this is the dog. <laughs> and so then on the way home, when we got home, I said, okay, kids, and, and Grandma was in, this, in on this, so she knew all along. She can uh, testify to this actually happening. I went downstairs, and we said, okay, keep, them, keep the kids downstairs. She, Muffin has to go to the bathroom after we've gone from Oakdale to here, so we'll be right outside the window. Don't let them see it. I'll come down the stairs and tell them, you know, come on up. So I told the kids, now here's the deal. We spent a lot of money in Pittsburgh, which is true. It was nice, but we did. So we only got you, you know, one souvenir. You're all going to have to share it. Without a moment's hesitation, Claire goes, a dog, and starts running up the stairs. <laughs> there it is, muffin. <laughs> the point of this story is that we made a promise. We make promises, don't we? Which was remembered day and night, especially by the dark-haired, freckled one you see right there. 
And we knew that one day we'd need to be good on our promise. Though having a dog was certainly a want, not a need. Just a few days into having her, I can tell you there's no doubt of the life that she's added even into our very life-filled home with her long, fluffy hair and her underbite. Promises matter, don't they? Some promises are especially important. We hear in Isaiah 56, 1, to keep justice and do righteousness. Why? For soon my salvation will come. Jesus is that salvation coming that Isaiah was speaking of. Jesus is the culmination of that long-promised, life-giving Messiah. And it's not just a gift for one family and one home. It's for all who would receive him. Further, the psalmist promises to keep and observe the law with his whole heart. This is a promise he's making. I'm going to do it. Now, while we Presbyterians certainly affirm that fallen creatures are unable to perfect our faith, we don't shy away from putting our faith or our heart into action. This is right from one of our confessions. The second Helvetic confession says it this way, that although we teach that man's justified by grace through faith in Christ and not through good works, we do not think that good works are of no value. We know that man was not created or regenerated through faith in order to be idle. Here's your quote. But rather, without ceasing, he or she should do those things which are good and useful. Man was not created or regenerated through faith in order to be idle. We're not just supposed to sit around. But rather, without ceasing, he should do those things which are good and useful. Psalm 119.35 says, Lead me in the paths of your commandments, for I delight in it. That suggests that divine obedience is fluid. It's ongoing. It's not the entire journey. Scholar Walter Brueggemann says that Torah obedience is a starting point, a launching pad, he says, from which to mount an ongoing conversation with God through daily experience. You just get going when you say, I'm going to do this. I promise. You're just getting going. It's an ongoing conversation with God. God's commandment then here is the ongoing process of faithfulness to our baptismal and our Christian covenants. We have both of our signs and our symbols here. We will be participating here in just a bit in our Lord's Supper, but then obviously also our beautiful baptismal font reminds us of the commitments, the covenant, the promises that we make there, which are even directly connected to here. We believers can relate to this, can't we? Here we are on Easter Sunday. Our churches are full. Praise the Lord. But Easter Monday through Saturday, day after day, season after season, year after year, that same Lord, that same Christ that calls us to be faithful, to remember and live into his commands is active. He's everywhere, not just in beautiful worship spaces. He's everywhere, active, calling us. Yet though he calls, we know, not all respond. All too many willingly walk Monday through Sunday toward unhealthy desires, back to this commandment, or covetousness of all kinds. And sadly, they all lead to death. All of them. We believers must incline our ears to testimony, the psalmist says, testimony and not selfish gain, turning from worthless things to worthwhile life. Do you get that? From the stuff that we all want, I want something, to worthwhile life. For a person who takes the Tenth Commandment seriously, we become storytellers. Let me tell you about what God did to me, for me, through me, through my friend, through my neighbor. Storytellers, not sensation sellers. I'm not, I'm not about that, okay? We shouldn't be about that. We should be authentic. Tell the story, the real story. Now, it's certainly the greatest story ever told, and you all have probably figured this out too. Of late, it seems like, and it's nice, I'm glad, that television and Hollywood have taken such a keen interest in the Bible. It's only been around for a whole lot longer than they have. That's great. But this story, 
This story of God's love of us in Christ is a living story despite its high or its low popularity. In overcoming the grave, the Lord gives us more than an idol to fashion. He gives us a story into which to live. Do you get that? You're a part of the story. He's a part of your story. Yet sadly, all too often, believers are tempted to make today, right here, today, Easter Sunday, more about displays of their consumeristic compass than their humble and honest faith in the resurrected Savior who rewrite their own story of brokenness, because who here isn't broken? All of us. Think about that. Other Christians focus, I believe, totally off base and wrong in Easter as an eternal life insurance policy. All right, we're set when it comes to that. And thereby they miss the reason for this season. We always say that in Christmas time, Advent leading up to Christmas, the reason for this season. If you're just thinking about heaven at Easter, you're missing the reason for this season. Heaven's great, and God willing, we'll see all one another there one day, but that's not the only reason for this season. It's not. The reason for this season is God, the ongoing story that's God's story. Not us. It's not about us. It never was, never will be. Focuses on either of these, what I call, fluff or fervor idols, eventually lead to covetousness. Today's about God and what God does for us in his righteousness. This is the glory of Easter's story. It is the righteousness, not our own, but of Christ. God raising Jesus from death unto life. It's this story in which we're given a new way to look at ourselves and others, not in sin or sorrow, but through life. You mean I can look at life that way? Yeah, I can, and I should. Knowing that the letter and the spirit of the law, the Ten Commandments, are a part of your faith is important. Absolutely. The active pursuit, though, of purity despite our fallen nature, is what faithfulness calls us to attempt. We're not going to get it right. It's not going to be perfect. We can't. Yet be warned. Human-centered righteousness always comes to that same conclusion. Failure, frustration, and false security. There's a quote from Abraham Lincoln to that end. It's difficult to make a man miserable while he feels worthy of himself and claims kindred to the great God who made him. You can take that a couple ways. But the psalmist says, I long for your precepts, and in your righteousness give me getting throughness. No, life! Psalm 119.40. Here, wants and needs, they connect. Where and how? In the righteousness of God. If and when a man feels worthy of himself, I got it, I'm good as President Lincoln said, or as the Apostle Paul warns later, does not have the Spirit of Christ, Romans 8, 9, or as John Stott said today, rejects having an internal moral standard, I don't need that, better than them, then the real reason for this holiday is bound to be highly problematic for such a navel gazer. That's tough, isn't it? It's tough for me. It's not about us deserving anything. It's about us living in thanksgiving because of he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. We heard that today, Romans 8, 32. That's what it's about. Which brings me to my somewhat startling question. Maybe you looked at it on the sign and went, "Ah, I think you messed something up there. And sermon title, do you believe in life before death? This is where we're going to linger for just a couple more minutes to close. This is significant. If you missed everything else, cue in now, please. Because I believe that Christians spend a whole lot more time thinking about death, death, even though glorious, I'll grant you that, we have heaven to look forward to, than we do about life here, now. Not because life here and now is going to be perfect, don't get me wrong, but I believe a lot of us are doing ourselves a disservice in our testimony of what God's done through us if we all just walk around talking about going to heaven all the time. We're not dead yet. We're alive. 
in Christ, through Christ, and because of Christ. So we need to ask if we believe in life before death. It didn't, this question didn't originate with me. I'm not that good, okay? I first heard it through our administrative assistant, Janice Hanna, who heard it from Leslie Stone, who read it in a book by Mooneyham Walter Stanley. Maybe you, some of you read this. I didn't read the whole book. I just read parts of it, entitled, What Do You Say to a Hungry World? It's from the early 70s. The author's question, this question, comes after hearing a missionary who encountered a man who had died of starvation less than 100 yards from his post. Now follow this. In that event, the missionary came face to face with his own failings, both moral and material. The autopsy showed that that man literally died of hunger. He had nothing in his stomach. Nothing except for some grass, a ball of grass and some leaves. And there was this missionary now, we all die, we know that, but there was this missionary right there, then and there, who could have helped him, and he blew it, and he came face to face with his own failings. So he started asking this, do I believe in life before death? Here and now, am I making a difference? Why did he miss it? Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this message. Why did he miss it? The book says... He missed it because he was more concerned about receiving the latest news about the possible change, change to his denomination than feeding the hungry. Sound familiar? While news of churches in our area moving to the EPC or ECHO or the demise of the Peace USA inundates our church meetings and presbytery meetings, I can't help but wonder how many persons are in need of life while we sit through meeting after meeting listening to talking heads fearing death of the institution? It may need to die. Okay, let's talk about life. Thou shalt not covet, friends, applies to other churches. Oh, I wish our church was this way. Stop it! As well as other denominations. If our denomination was only this way, stop it! Th friends, Satan will use any tool he can to get God's people focused on all the wrong things. Just get them wishing they were somebody else. I'm good. Do you get that? I hope so. I can't help but wonder how much new life, even in the best of all possible circumstances, would come. I don't know. After making a change to one's denomination, I can't help but wonder. And if you have friends or families who have gone through this with their churches, seriously consider this. If the real issue in their church isn't the sign in front of their church, but its internal compass, which is soured to doing mission outside of its comfort zone. Oh, if we just distance ourselves from those heathens in that denomination, maybe people will come in. Baloney! People need to know your story. It's about the testimony of God in Christ working through you. Think about that. Here's an even harder quote from that same book. M. Walter Stanley says, God loathes a church that revels in an impractical and unapplied piety. <sighs> That's a good one, isn't it? God loathes a church that revels in an impractical and unapplied piety. I think he's right. I think he's right. The church should always be focused on the life that we have in Christ Jesus. Life that's recharged. Life that's motivated by and life that's an outpouring of God's eternal hope, compassion, and love. Not idly, but in action. We dare not dilute our awareness to our application of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. But performance to the law does not save life because of and in and through Jesus Christ alone saves. In conclusion, the Apostle Paul says, you've also died to the law. How? Through the body of Christ. That's the reason for today. So that you may belong to one another, to him who's been raised from the dead in order that we may, what? Sit around and talk about how great heaven's going to be? No! Bear fruit. Get to work. Love the world that even God created. So then on this Easter morning, friends, 
Instead of seeing your belief as, in a resurrected Savior as only a reason to look forward to heaven, and it will be glorious, but as only a reason to look forward to heaven, why not look around to the world that was created and redeemed by God, to persons who right now are in need, to a church and a denomination, because this is where I'm at on this, that needs truth spoken in love. I'm not watering down the gospel. I'm sticking here. But I'm going to speak the truth in love in the same denomination. And to families that need men and women and children who are life-giving recipients of the greatest promise ever kept. He is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen. Amen. Friends, this is your table. This is part of your story, part of your testimony, your Savior that created you just like you are. Unique and special in your own ways. Him. He fashioned this table for you. And just as there's many uh, places of 
eating around these parts that probably have a, a great big celebration of one kind or another, or maybe you will at your own home. There's invitations to it. Will you come, whether formal, printed, or not? Can you come? We'll reserve a spot for you. This is reserved for you. You're invited to this table because of the connection through here to here. So all baptized believers are welcome. But denominational affiliation, less important to us and less important to the Lord than affiliation with the Lord, Jesus Christ. So this is your table, friends. Hear your invitation as coming not even certainly from me or necessarily this church, but from him. Come together. Break and the bread and drink the wine, the juice. Share together, he says. Let us pray together. Holy God, we've come here today because of you. Because somewhere along the line, somebody in our life loved you enough to teach us about you, to turn just words into a personal testimony, not some flamboyant thing that makes us look better than others, but the real raw, broken, but changed spirit that we've received because of your Holy Spirit. And because of them, we say thank you, whoever they are in our lives. We know some of them have gone on to glory, and others are still with us. If they're aged or ailing, we pray that you would help them and heal them, comfort them. If they're far from us, we pray that you'd surround them with your spirit. Help them to feel close to you and to us today. And if for whatever reason we've fallen out of favor with them, we say, help us, Lord, to extend the olive branch first and to show the unexpected radical love to them that you give to us, every one of us. We pray for all of those in our church family that have been a part and for those who will yet become a part of our fellowship. Not a term, Lord Jesus, that we use to simply describe something we do in a room with food and balloons, but our life encapsulated in this table, our life, because you give us life, our mission to motivate others to mission, not just to talking heads. We do pray for our denomination, Lord Jesus. We're not giving up on it, but we also know when it airs. We pray that as we would be witnesses to us, to it, help us to be the way you want us to be. Faithful and loving and truth-telling. We do pray for all those churches that have found new homes in different denominations. May their transition, irregardless of the denomination, infuse in them a, some, sort of, some sort of Holy Spirit that they haven't been aware of before. Hold them to a higher accountability if they haven't done so already. And for those churches, whether they're one of our own or others that are slowly dying, and for those churches that are rapidly growing, both of them, we pray that your Holy Spirit would so be present to all of their members that today, of all days, on this Easter Sunday, they would feel life. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. The words the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I say to you, that on the night in which Christ was betrayed, 
he took bread. And after he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me always. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And pouring it out, he said, This is my blood, which is the seal for mission of all of your sins. The new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me also. So then, friends, every time we eat of the bread, drink of the cup, We proclaim the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, body and blood, until he comes again in glory. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God.
Why wouldn't it have been perfect timing? Huh? Friends, this is the body of Christ, which out of love for you, despite all of your complexities, are we complex, failings, and frustrating attributes that we so inhabit, despite that, despite your long-winded preacher, God loves you enough to do what he did for you and for anybody that would love him. This is the body of Christ broken for you.
friends, life bearers together. The blood of Christ, which has been shed for all of you. Drink all of it. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time of worship. Thank you for this place, this wonderful, timeless house of worship. Thank you for all those who are here right now. And thank you for all those who will be touched in a good way by all of those who are here now. As we live for you, Lord Jesus, may we live not on only our own abilities, but because of connecting together, worshiping you, and joining together in this sacrament, spiritually changed, recharged to constantly be your faithful ones who sing and live boldly because you arose. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Your people of a resurrected Savior live today as if it matters. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be always yours. Amen.